Hi everyone. We're at the top of page 419. Ron, or I mean Harry and Hermione made it through their attempts to get Buckbeak out of harm's way. He picked up Sirius. Sirius got away and they're back in the hospital wing where they started, successful on their mission, and they just heard a bunch of loud crashing noises. So Harry, Hermione, and Madame Pomfrey are discussing that now. Now they could hear angry voices growing louder and louder. Madame Pomfrey was staring at the door. Really? They'll wake everybody up? What do they think they're doing? Harry was trying to hear what the voices were saying. They were drawing nearer. He must have disapparated, Severus. We should have left somebody in the room with him. When this gets out, he didn't disapparate. Snape roared, now very close at hand. You can't apparate or disapparate inside this castle. This has something to do with Potter. Severus, be reasonable. Harry has been locked up. Bam! The door of the hospital wing burst open. Fudge, Snape, and Dumbledore came striding into the ward. Dumbledore alone looked calm. Indeed, he looked as though he was quite enjoying himself. Fudge appeared angry, but Snape was beside himself. Out with it, Potter, he bellowed. What did you do? Professor Snape, shrieked Madame Pomfrey. Control yourself. See here, Snape, be reasonable, said Fudge. This door's been locked. We just saw. They helped him escape. I know it, Snape howled, pointing at Harry and Hermione. His face was twisted. Spit was flying from his mouth. Calm down, man, Fudge barked. You're talking nonsense. You don't know, Potter, shrieked Snape. He did it. I know he did it. That will do, Severus, said Dumbledore quietly. Think about what you are saying. This door has been locked since I left the ward ten minutes ago. Madame Pomfrey, have these students left their beds? Of course not, said Madame Pomfrey, bristling. I would have heard them. Well, there you have it, Severus, said Dumbledore calmly, unless you are suggesting that Harry and Hermione are able to be in two places at once. I'm afraid I don't see any point in troubling them further. Snape stood there, seething, staring from Fudge, who looked thoroughly shocked at his behavior, to Dumbledore, whose eyes were twinkling behind his glasses. Snape whirled about, robes swishing behind him, and stormed out of the ward. Fellow seems quite unbalanced, said Fudge, staring after him. I'd watch out for him if I were you, Dumbledore. Oh, he's not unbalanced, said Dumbledore quietly. He's just suffered a severe disappointment. He's not the only one, puffed Fudge. The Daily Prophet's going to have a field day. We had Black cornered, and he slipped through our fingers yet again. All it needs now is for the story of that hippogriff's escape to get out, and I'll be a laughing stock. Well, I'd better go and notify the ministry. And the Dementors, said Dumbledore, they'll be removed from the school, I trust? Oh, yes, they'll have to go, said Fudge, running his fingers distractedly through his hair. Never dreamed they'd attempt to administer the kiss on an innocent boy completely out of control. No, I'll have them packed off back to Azkaban tonight. Perhaps we should think about dragons at the school entrance. Hagrid would like that, said Dumbledore, smiling at Harry and Hermione. As he and Fudge left the dormitory, Madame Pomfrey hurried to the door and locked it again. Muttering angrily to herself, she headed back to her office. There was a low moan from the other end of the ward. Ron had woken up. They could see him sitting up, rubbing his head, looking around. What, what happened? He groaned. Harry, why are we in here? Where's Sirius? Where's Lupin? What's going on? Harry and Hermione looked at each other. You explain, said Harry, helping himself to some more chocolate. When Harry, Ron, and Hermione left the hospital wing at noon the next day, it was to find an almost deserted castle. The sweltering heat in the end of the exams meant that everyone was taking full advantage of another Hogsmeade visit. Neither Ron nor Hermione felt like going, however, so they and Harry wandered onto the grounds, still talking about the extraordinary events of the previous night, and wondering where Sirius and Buckbeak were now. Sitting near the lake, watching the giant squid waving its tentacles lazily above the water, Harry lost the thread of the conversation as he looked across to the opposite bank. The stag had galloped toward him from there just last night. A shadow fell across them, and they looked up to see a very bleary-eyed Hagrid mopping his sweaty face with one of his tablecloth-sized handkerchiefs and beaming down at them. No, I shouldn't feel happy after what happened last night, he said. I mean, black escaping again and everything. But guess what? What? they said, pretending to look curious. Beaky! He escaped! He's free! Been celebrating all night! That's wonderful, said Hermione, giving Ron a reproving look, because he looked as though he was close to laughing. 
Yeah, can't have tied him up properly, said Hagrid, gazing happily out over the grounds. I was worried this morning, mind. Thought he might have met Professor Lupin on the grounds, but Lupin says he never ate anything last night. What? said Harry quickly. Blimey, haven't you heard? said Hagrid, his smile fading a little. He lowered his voice, even though there was nobody in sight. Uh, Snape told all the Slytherins this morning. Thought everyone know by now. Professor Lupin's a werewolf, see? And he was loose on the grounds last night. He's packing now, of course. He's packing? said Harry, alarmed. Why? Leaving, isn't he? said Hagrid, looking surprised that Harry had to ask. Resigned first thing this morning, says he can't risk it happening again. Harry scrambled to his feet. I'm going to see him, he said to Ron and Hermione. But if he's resigned, doesn't sound like there's anything we can do. I don't care. I still want to see him. I'll meet you back here. Lupin's office door was open. He had already packed most of his things. The Grindy Lowe's empty tank stood next to his battered old suitcase, which was open and nearly full. Lupin was bending over something on his desk and looked up only when Harry knocked on the door. I saw you coming, said Lupin, smiling. He pointed to the parchment he had been poring over. It was the Morator's map. I just saw Hagrid, said Harry, and he said you'd resigned. It's not true, is it? I'm afraid it is, said Lupin. He started opening his desk drawers and taking out the contents. Why, said Harry, the Ministry of Magic don't think you were helping Sirius, do they? Lupin crossed to the door and closed it behind Harry. No, Professor Dumbledore managed to convince Fudge that I was trying to save your lives, he sighed. That was the final straw for Severus. I think the loss of the Order of Merlin hit him hard. So he, uh, accidentally let slip that I am a werewolf this morning at breakfast. You're not leaving just because of that, said Harry. Lupin smiled wryly. This time tomorrow, the owls will start arriving from parents. They will not want a werewolf teaching their children, Harry. And after last night, I see their point. I could have bitten any of you. That must never happen again. You're the best defense against the dark arts teacher we've ever had, said Harry. Don't go. Lupin shook his head and didn't speak. He carried on emptying his drawers. Then, while Harry was trying to think of a good argument to make him stay, Lupin said, From what the headmaster told me this morning, you saved a lot of lives last night, Harry. If I'm proud of anything I've done this year, it's how much you've learned. Tell me about your Patronus. How'd you know about that? said Harry, distracted. What else could have driven the Dementors back? Harry told Lupin what had happened. When he'd finished, Lupin was smiling again. Yes, your father was always a stag when he transformed. He said, you guessed right. That's why we called him Prongs. Lupin threw his last few books into his case, closed the desk drawers, and turned to look at Harry. Here, I brought this from the Shrieking Shack last night, he said, handing Harry back the invisibility cloak. And, he hesitated, then held out the Morator's map too. I am no longer your teacher, so I don't feel guilty about giving you back this as well. It's no use to me, and I dare say you, Ron, and Hermione will find uses for it. Harry took the map and grinned. You told me Mooney, Wormtail, Padfoot, and Prongs would have wanted to lure me out of school. You said they'd have thought it was funny. And so we would have, said Lupin, now reaching down to close his case. I have no hesitation in saying that James would have been highly disappointed if his son had never found any of the secret passages out of the castle. There was a knock on the door. Harry hastily stuffed the Morator's map and the invisibility cloak into his pocket. It was Professor Dumbledore. He didn't look surprised to see Harry there. Your carriage is at the gates, Remus, he said. Thank you, Headmaster. Lupin picked up his old suitcase and the empty Grindy low tank. Well, goodbye, Harry, he said, smiling. It has been a real pleasure teaching you. I feel sure we'll meet again sometime. Headmaster, there is no need to see me to the gates. I can manage. Harry had the impression that Lupin wanted to leave as quickly as possible. Goodbye then, Remus, said Dumbledore soberly. Lupin shifted the Grindy low tank slightly so that he and Dumbledore could shake hands. Then, with a final nod to Harry and a swift smile, Lupin left the office. Harry sat down in his vacated chair, staring glumly at the floor. He heard the door close and looked up. Dumbledore was still there. Why so miserable, Harry? He said quietly. You should be very proud of yourself after last night. It didn't make any difference, said Harry bitterly. Pettigrew got away. Didn't make any difference, said Dumbledore quietly. It made all the difference in the world, Harry. You helped uncover the truth. You saved an innocent man from a terrible fate. Terrible. Something stirred in Harry's memory. Greater and more terrible than ever before. Professor Trelawney's prediction. Professor Dumbledore, yesterday when I was having my divination exam, Professor Trelawney went very, very strange. Indeed, said Dumbledore. Uh, stranger than usual, you mean? Yes, her voice went all deep and her eyes rolled and she said, she said Voldemort's servant was going to set out to return to him before midnight. 
She said the servant would help him come back to power. Harry stared up at Dumbledore. And then she sort of became normal again, and she couldn't remember anything she'd said. Was it... Was she making a real prediction? Dumbledore looked mildly impressed. Do you know, Harry, I think she might have been, he said thoughtfully. Who'd have thought it? That brings her total of real predictions up to two. I should offer her a pay raise. But, Harry looked at him aghast. How could Dumbledore take this so calmly? But, I stopped Sirius and Professor Lupin from killing Pettigrew. That makes it my fault if Voldemort comes back. It does not, said Dumbledore quietly. Hasn't your experience with the time-turner taught you anything, Harry? The consequences of our actions are always so complicated, so diverse, that predicting the future is a very difficult business indeed. Professor Trelawney, bless her, is living proof of that. You did a very noble thing in saving Pettigrew's life. But if he helps Voldemort back to power, Pettigrew owes his life to you. You have sent Voldemort a deputy who was in your debt. When one wizard saves another wizard's life, it creates a certain bond between them, and I'm much mistaken if Voldemort wants his servant in the debt of Harry Potter. I don't want a connection with Pettigrew, said Harry. He betrayed my parents. This is magic at its deepest. It's most impenetrable, Harry. But trust me, the time may come when you will be very glad you saved Pettigrew's life. Harry couldn't imagine when that would be. Dumbledore looked as though he knew what Harry was thinking. I knew your father very well. Both at Hogwarts and later, Harry, he said gently. He would have saved Pettigrew, too. I am sure of it. Harry looked up at him. Dumbledore wouldn't laugh. He could tell Dumbledore. I thought it was my dad who'd conjured my Patronus. I mean, when I saw myself across the lake, I thought I was seeing him. An easy mistake to make, said Dumbledore softly. I expect you'll tire of hearing of it, but you do look extraordinarily like James. Except for the eyes. You have your mother's eyes. Harry shook his head. It was stupid thinking it was him, he muttered. I mean, I knew he was dead. You think the dead we loved ever truly leave us? You think that we don't recall them more clearly than ever in times of great trouble? Your father is alive in you, Harry, and shows himself most plainly when you have need of him. How else could you produce that particular Patronus? Prongs rode again last night. It took a moment for Harry to realize what Dumbledore had said. Last night, Sirius told me all about how they became animagi, said Dumbledore, smiling. An extraordinary achievement, not least keeping it quiet from me. And then I remembered the most unusual form your Patronus took when it changed Mr. Malfoy down at your Quidditch match against Ravenclaw. You know, Harry, in a way, you did see your father last night. You found him inside yourself. And Dumbledore left the office, leaving Harry to his very confused thoughts. Nobody at Hogwarts now knew the truth of what had happened the night that Sirius, Buckbeak, and Pettigrew had vanished except Harry, Ron, Hermione, and Professor Dumbledore. As the end of term approached, Harry heard many different theories about what had really happened, but none of them came close to the truth. Malfoy was furious about Buckbeak. He was convinced that Hagrid had found a way of smuggling the Hippogriff to safety and seemed outraged that he and his father had been outwitted by a gamekeeper. Percy Weasley, meanwhile, had much to say on the subject of Sirius's escape. If I manage to get into the ministry, I'll have a lot of proposals to make about magical law enforcement, he told the only person who would listen, his girlfriend Penelope. Though the weather was perfect, though the atmosphere was so cheerful, though he knew they had achieved the near impossible in helping Sirius to freedom, Harry had never approached the end of a school year in worse spirits. He certainly wasn't the only one who was sorry to see Professor Lupin go. The whole of Harry's defense against the dark arts class was miserable about his resignation. Wonder what they'll give us next year, said Seamus Finnegan gloomily. Maybe a vampire, suggested Dean Thomas hopefully. It wasn't only Professor Lupin's departure that was weighing on Harry's mind. He couldn't help thinking a lot about Professor Trelawney's prediction. He kept wondering where Pettigrew was now, whether he had sought sanctuary with Voldemort yet. But the thing that was lowering Harry's spirits most of all was the prospect of returning to the Dursleys. For maybe half an hour, a glorious half hour, he had believed he would be living with Sirius from now on his parents' best friend. It would have been the next best thing to having his own father back. And while no news of Sirius was definitely good news because it meant he had successfully gone into hiding, Harry couldn't help feeling miserable when he thought of the home he might have had and the fact that it was now impossible. Time's up, guys.